Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation uh, to come and speak. I'd like to uh, underscore John's comments. I'm actually um, speaking today on behalf of the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, I'm on the board of directors. I'm also on the board of the U.S. Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, and we have the GeoInt Symposium um, every year. And I, I agree. You know, we'd be hard-pressed to find a general uh, in any of uh, uh, the U.S. military um, that could speak uh, to the issues of geospatial intelligence as well as um, your senior leaders here. So, and I think it's a real pleasure to come and watch. Um, so I'm going to speak today on uh, geospatial technology, special operations, in particular a focus on interoperability. Uh, if you've seen a presentation from the Open Geospatial Consortium before, this is unlike anyone that's ever been done, mostly because I'm going to focus on special operations and not on the technology and interoperability. I'll come to that towards the end. But yeah, at the beginning, uh, for those of you who don't know what the Open Geospatial Consortium is, it is the international standards body uh, for uh, geospatial interoperability and, uh, and standards. Um, there's a broad membership here in India and around the world with nearly 500 organizations from government, industry, uh, university, and nonprofit sectors. And it's really a global forum for the collaboration of developers and users uh, of spatial data products and services uh, to advance the development of international standards for geospatial interoperability. Um, I'll come back to that towards the end. But I want to talk about Special Operations Forces, and admittedly, I'm an American, and I will talk about this a bit from an American perspective. I'm talking about a 72,000-person force that's globally distributed across all of our different combatant commands, and they have a wide variety of uh, functions that they serve. Uh, this acronym SOUP here at the bottom, uh, if you look in, uh, if you talk about Special Operations and Irregular Warfare, a term I'm not particularly keen on myself, uh, you'll see a wide range of different kinds of operations that we expect our special operations forces to be able to support. Counterterrorism, which I'll talk about uh, in my next slides, has been a big focus over the past 10 years. Counterinsurgency also. But we also talk about foreign internal defense, security forces assistance, uh, security stability transition reconstruction uh, operations, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, uh, a lot of information operations, and then uh, unconventional warfare. Uh, that uh, some of the uh, earlier speaker uh, spoke about so eloquently. Um, over the past decade, uh, once we found, uh, once the United States uh, and coalition found ourselves in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, there was a lot of effort put into uh, ops intel fusion, particularly through our joint uh, special operations uh, command. Um, the term F3EAD, or the acronym F3EAD, uh, was created mostly out of practice uh, on how to engage in counter-network operations and at such a pace um, that you can collapse these terrorist networks or insurgent networks uh, every night, literally sending teams and teams out to collapse these networks. And we use the term find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze, and disseminate as a cycle that you go through continuously. And as you find your adversary, which is inherently geospatial, right? The term locate uh, comes to mind. Uh, as you find them, and then you fix on that target uh, with your mix of surveillance uh, uh, technologies, um, you actually engage in whatever operation it is to finish that target, which may be a capture or a kill scenario. Uh, and then you actually go through everything that you find. Um, uh, for, to exploit all the media that you find, et cetera, analyze it, and then disseminate the results. And you may go through this cycle half a dozen times in one night in order to collapse the network that you're targeting. This was a methodology uh, kind of perfected or honed by these two men, General Stanley McChrystal and uh, now Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, who is the current head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, uh, them and their teams, obviously. Uh, to, to kind of hone this ops intel fusion, really focused on CT because that was the fight that we were in, CT and then counterinsurgency. Mostly in Iraq was in an urban environment that, frankly, we never intended to end up in. If you remember that conflict and rewind uh, history a little bit, that started out as major combat operations uh, scenario, and then we found ourselves uh, in an urban setting with a uh, insurgent network and then increasingly a terrorist network that we had to deal with. Um, 
so we had to deal with that in an urban setting. In Afghanistan, uh, not a terribly urban country, uh, we found ourselves in a similar situation, albeit in complex terrain, not urban terrain. But I'll talk quite a bit about terrain uh, as I go through this. So uh, this is just another view of the F3EA cycle kind of put into the D3A cycle. And I know it's really low resolution, hard to see, but you'll see a lot of words like locate and track. Everything here is inherently geospatial. And in my experience over the past 10 years in, in the U.S. Uh, military, it is the special operations forces that have been the highest and most sophisticated consumers of geospatial uh, technology by far. So I always like to say geospatial is at the heart of special operations forces, certainly in the U.S. Um, it, at every stage of find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze, and dissemination, geospatial is there. Even when you're doing the media exploitation of the things that you find in, in your adversary's lair, you're trying to geolocate out of that. You may be using natural language processing technology to parse through the text the language on you know, their digital media in order to find other locations that you may need to um, roll into that evening or in following evenings in order to collapse that network. But at every stage here, geospatial is at the heart of SOF. And, you know, a lot of the focus, uh, and maybe because it's um, sexier and glitzier, has been really on geospatial intelligence and geolocated ISR generally, whether it's geolocated signals intelligence, etc. But I always like to point out that we really should not forget the criticality of high-res, human-scale 3D data. Uh, because in the end, uh, that fixed part of the scenario of F3EAD, we're not just doing this for the purpose of intelligence. We're doing this in support of maneuver and maneuver commanders that are going to go into treacherous terrain, whether it's urban or complex, uh, you know, mountainous terrain. They're going to go in uh, uh, on a night raid or whatever that particular scenario is. And without that, that physical terrain, you can't do the kinds of analysis uh, that we saw in, in a number of the, the, in, in the previous speakers' presentations. So I just put this up as kind of a, a generic meter posting LIDAR collection of uh, some random place, probably in Iraq. Um, because this is the sort of environment you're dropping somebody in. Out of that fine, fix, finish, exploit, analyze, dissemination cycle, you're actually geolocating that network. You're identifying who in that network you have to go after, um, and, and you're identifying where they are or where they likely are. And this is the sort of thing you actually have to survive. In the previous presentation, I looked at those, those horrific mountains that you have to navigate with your teams. And, you know, the same sort of thing we had to deal with in Afghanistan. It's a nightmare. But urban is, you know, its own challenge. And you need to have your high-res 3D uh, physical and built terrain data in order to even prosecute that F3 EAD cycle. Uh, so I, I, I always like to, geospatial is at the heart of soft, but without your terrain data, you kind of have nothing. And it's one thing to talk about its importance in, in direct action scenarios, kind of these capture, kill, F3EA driven CT operations. But increasingly, uh, in the US, uh, I guess based on our experience in the past 10 years, we're talking about shifting our focus to partner capacity building for phase zero and phase minus shaping operations. And this, this data is just as important, if not more important, in supporting that sort of, those sorts of operations, even though they're not primarily kinetic and they're not primarily target-oriented. Um, why? Because geospatial helps build trust. So uh, Admiral McRaven is our, our current head of Special Operations Command in Tampa. Um, we have the, the command itself, which is a global combatant command, uh, but we also have our, for our individual forces, whether it's Army Special Forces or it's Naval Special Warfare, et cetera. Um, and, and there's a bit of reorganization going on right now in terms of how he can allocate that force dynamically against a dynamic threat. And he's been uh, talking quite a bit. You can just go on Google and, uh, and read about it. I'm not telling you anything that, that isn't out there in the news um, about his vision for global soft network uh, come 2020. And one of these terms that he uses a lot that I, I've kind of fallen in love with is you can't surge trust. When things go bad and you need to move fast, you can surge weapons, you can surge forces, you can surge data, you can surge a lot of things, but you can't surge trust if you're going to work by, with, and through your partners in other nations. And, and that's really the mode that the United States 
has moved to over the past several years in Afghanistan. We heard quite a bit about the NATO soft um, uh, experience that I think has served us very well, and we've learned as a country a lot of uh, lessons about that. But we have to build these relationships over time so when things go bad, you can move in with your partners with, with trust because you're talking about moving fast, moving hard, and if you don't have trust, you have nothing. And I strongly believe that geospatial data becomes the key foundation for building those trust relationships over time. This isn't data you should collect once you know where your target is and have just-in-time delivery of data. This is data you need to have about these urban environments and these complex mountainous terrains um, in order to engage in that mission planning, rehearsal, and yes, execution of these missions with your partners. And if you don't have that data uh, uh, beforehand, I, I think it's very difficult to build those trust relationships you have. In our case, it's a lot of uh, international trust relationships, but it's also interagency trust relationships, because you're talking about engaging in this uh, joint mission planning rehearsal um, process with all of the different intelligence agencies and all the different services. So I think it's key to being prepared with those trust relationships when you have to serve. But all, surge, but also geospatial helps you shape. And I'm not sure if this term is used uh, here in India, but in, in our um, special forces, uh, uh, special operations forces lingo, we use the word shape a lot. We want to shape our environment. And when we talk uh, where we're trying to shift our allocation these days of, of resources, we're really focusing on phase zero and phase minus shaping operations. We want to go to situations where they're pre-kinetic where we don't have to run around killing people in the middle of the night, where we can work with host nation uh, uh, through military to military relationships, but even military to civil relationships, and build capacity in those areas to make them, um, frankly, safe, secure, and hopefully even prosperous, because it's those kinds of environments where you, don't, you tend not to have long-term security threats. And you know, one term I, I always like to throw out, because it's a different side of the geospatial enterprise, um, but we have an Army Corps of Engineers that's actually present in 132 countries around the world helping other militaries and helping other civilian agencies build capacity um, and literally construct uh, a better, I'd say, a better world to live in. Uh, you know, you come to a beautiful city like Delhi and it's because you have this built environment and you have things that uh, are heavily engineered for people so you can live a prosperous life. And most of these conflict zones are places that don't have that. And so, you know, one side of our phase zero and phase minus shaping operations is uh, supporting uh, building that capability. And anybody who's ever been involved in construction knows that construction begins with a survey. It's just these days we can kind of fly it very efficiently from uh, 10,000 feet on an airplane instead of, you know, having people uh, on the ground doing surveys. So. Um, one of the, the things that's come out of the past 10 years of our experience in Special Forces is, yes, you need those extremely classified, exquisite capabilities that support black operations. But in order to be successful with your partners for by, with, and through, you need unclassified, shareable, human-scale sources of data, high-res 3D sources of data. And without that unclassified data, we would not have been able to partner effectively with uh, the Afghan army, the Afghan national police, et cetera, because we simply cannot share our top secret SCI classified sources of geospatial intelligence. And I think this is, again, key to um, building those trust relationships that you can be successful with. So if, you know, geospatial situation awareness demands interoperability, back to the Open Geospatial Consortium theme, uh, you've got many different sources. Yes, we can just call it geospatial intelligence, but you have to remember that high-res 3D terrain data is kind of its own space. Uh, ISR in the U.S., we kind of use ISR to talk about airborne ISR a lot. And uh, God knows how many actual airplanes we had in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq collecting all sorts of data. That's its own microcosm that you have to bring it together. Media exploitation from the F3EA cycle, uh, all of your operational data. I think the scenario we saw earlier was great in, in showing you the wide variety of data that you need to bring together uh, successfully. And those are massive interoperability issues uh, all around geospatial interoperability. To say it another day, right, uh, another way, how do you bring your foundation data, your sensor data, your sociocultural data? And I agree with John's comment that, at least in the United States, the highest uh, end consumers of human geography data and sociocultural data are our special operations forces because they are the people 
uh, embedded in the populations, um, and they need to understand those dynamics to be effective. Plus your big data, plus your mission command data, all of that is an interoperability issue because you're dealing with emergent challenges, irregular security operations, irregular warfare, none of it's standard. Most of these guys are your highest end performers that you're, you're asking to make it up as they go along. Right? They're dealing with dynamic situations and taking their, their, their great uh, resources of, you know, I'd say their, their surplus of skills in order to um, be creative and to deal with unanticipated data sources even. So if you go into a special operations fusion cell in the United States, they're not dealing simply with military specified data sources coming out of military specified systems. They will use whatever data is useful to the mission sourced from whatever source they can get it from. And there are huge interoperability and data management issues associated with that. So interoperability in space and time across many different systems in order, uh, in order to achieve is key to achieving human scale situational awareness. So uh, we talk about geospatial situational awareness a lot, and I think that's great. But when you talk about soft, you're talking about human scale. You're dealing with people. And if your physical terrain data isn't at human scale, and if your geolocation isn't at a human scale, you will not be effective at prosecuting population-centric operations. I think I'm near the end. So this is why the Open Geospatial Consortium exists, not for Special Operations Forces, not for US SOCOM, but to deal with exactly these kinds of issues that I think are just particularly acute in the Special Operations Forces environment. Um, geospatial interoperability standards enable the dynamic composition of these various data sources in support of fast-changing, emergent mission challenges. In many cases, you know, the, uh, our our conventional forces that may only deploy a major combat op operation so often and may not have to move that fast have, have survived without a high level of interoperability and integration, uh, almost despite themselves sometimes. But in special operations, they don't have that luxury. They have to move so fast and their challenge is moving so fast that interoperability is a premium. Um, so I just put this up because if you don't know what OGC specifications are, no problem. I mean, you can go on the web, you can learn about these, opengeospatial.org, you can read all about them. There are all the standards for serving up maps and features and describing cities and serving out syndicating messages and serving them out over cell phones and packaging them up for mobile devices and processing and augmented reality and sensors. There's a whole body of these standards out there. Why? Because as you saw from John's diagrams, you're talking about a family of systems that you have to bring together. And to have interoperability, you have to have all the right different standards. Um, uh, and, and this is really what OGC works on. Uh, if you come to an OGC, I don't necessarily recommend all of you guys coming to an OGC meeting because they're highly technical meetings, but if you want people to understand the issues around interoperability to bring your family and systems together, I do recommend that you actually send your smart technical folks to OGC meetings wherever they happen to be uh, once a quarter anywhere around the world. Um, because in the end, all of your warfighting functions, whether it's special warfare or whether it's you know, uh, conventional warfare, your maneuver, your logistics, your intel, your fires, your mission command, and on and on and on, must be integrated in space and time uh, across all your mission partners, right? It's not just your, for your force, but all your mission partners in order to support these irregular warfare operations, what I like to call irregular security operations. So conclusion, soft about partnership. Um, yeah, it's sexy. It's about guns and equipment and, you know, being effective in kinetic operations. But in the end, you're talking about building partnerships uh, across your agencies and apart, uh, across your um, different services and even uh, mil-civ-civ-civ type relationships. So SOFT is about partnership and partnerships require shared understanding. You cannot have an effective partnership unless everybody's on the same page. And geospatial interoperability is key to building that shared understanding, and that's really the business that the OGC is in. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, just my last slide is to point out that for all of your smart technical guys that uh, you think should learn more about the OGC, uh, India will actually be hosting the OGC technical committee meetings on uh, uh, December 2 through 5, uh, 2013 in uh, Mumbai. Um, it's sponsored by DSNT, uh, our, our good friend, uh, General uh, Dr. Shiva Kumar. And um, if you ever have a question about OGC, uh, Dr. M.K. Munshi is um, doing yeoman's work, I think, in India, bringing everybody together around the topics of interoperability. Uh, so you can reach him at that email, but I can't see him in the crowd because the lights are too big. Oh, I actually can't see him in the crowd. M.K. 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 Stand up. Wave to the crowd.
There you go. You should talk to this man because he has all the answers. I'm just uh, the guy talking today. So thank you very much.